My kid is the cutest kid in the world. I'm just saying. It's the truth. <laughs> oh, it was so neat. When Ashlyn and I, we were watering some plants, and I realized out here you're not supposed to water them as much because we're in this drought. We were careful. We're sitting there watering, and all of a sudden, there's this moment where Ashlyn says, Daddy, look! And I looked, and there was this beautiful little rainbow, a double rainbow, if you will. <laughs> and I kept seeing this rainbow, and Ashlyn said, Daddy, it's beautiful. I said, yeah, it's a rainbow. And then we shut off the water, and she went, what happened? Where'd it go? And so we turned the water back on, and she gets so excited. There it is again. And I turn it off. Where'd it go? And so finally, after a few minutes of this, she stops and she says, Daddy, can we put the water on everything? It was beautiful because Ashlyn understood that the water was somehow enabling us to see something that our eyes typically couldn't see. And so when you look at this color spectrum, um, I was just doing a little research on color, and I am not a scientist. I don't know all of the lingo, and I'm probably going to screw it up here and there today. But what I found is that colors are actually the way in which our eyes detect the different energies of light radiation. Didn't I sound like a pro just then? It's because I read it. Um, we measure these different uh, energies, and if you go back one slide, if you go back, there, uh, there are these waves. Weird. We're seeing blue, that's good. Uh, there are these waves, and what these waves do is, if you think of like when you throw a rock into, a, into the water, there are these waves, and they create these ripples. And so when we look at the waves, we can figure out what the frequency is by, again, how many of these peaks go past every second. There it is. Yay, we got it. And so if you move to the next one, we get this radiation, and this is what's kind of visible to our eyes. But the sad reality I'm finding, next slide, is that we are only, we're only able to see like a very small portion of the color spectrum. So when you look at this, you'll see visible light. We see a very little amount of it. And then we have UV, UV X-ray, gamma, infrared, microwave, radio. And scientists, when I was reading some articles on light, they said that they hypothesize that there's a whole color scheme, a color spectrum that we're not even aware of. And if our eyes could see it, it would blow us away. We'd be like, what? It's everywhere. We'd be seeing rainbows everywhere. Isn't that cool? So our eyes, we're only able to see a certain amount of things, and it's kind of sad. The beauty that's all around us, we're only seeing a very small sliver of it. Our ears, I want you to think about this. Um, we get these vibrations all the time in our ears and these different sound frequencies, but consider this. We've got to get on this picture. Um, consider this. When you're looking at the, or when you're listening to different frequencies, oftentimes your ear is hearing different things, and you'll get these different waves. And next slide. What we hear, we only get mid-range. And so it's interesting because you hear ultrasound, and then, or you don't hear ultrasound, and you don't hear infrasound. And so I don't know how many of you, do any of you have a dog at home, raise your hand if that's you. This freaks me out. I'll be sitting in the living room, and my dog, Ellie, she'll be sitting there, and all of a sudden, Ellie will start doing this. Uh, oof, oof. I'm like, Ellie, what's the matter? Is Timmy in a well? And so I, f I follow Ellie. I follow her to the door, and I look. Nothing. I'm like, Ellie, what's the matter? Where's Timmy? What's going on, Ellie? And Ellie just looks at me, and she's like, woof, woof. So finally, like, crazy dog. Silly dog. And so I send her back to her bed, and I'm like, naughty. She goes and sits down. And then two minutes later, someone rings the doorbell. And I'm like, what? What happened? Ellie, it's freaky because she is able to smell and hear and all these things that I just am not aware of. There are all these beautiful 
things that go on that our eyes are not aware of. Our senses don't pick up. And I would claim that that's because we have become numb to a lot of realities around us. And the same thing is with God. We become very numb to his presence, so much so that we begin asking questions like this. Where is God? Maybe God really did just create us and say, you're dirty, you're gross. Step back and say, you're on your own. We start asking questions and start to think of God in that way because we have become numb to his presence. We're going to look at this issue today. And before we do, let me pray with you. God, I want to thank you and praise you for bringing us here this morning. And Lord, I just ask that you'll remove me from the equation and you will just stand center stage and give us a beautiful story of where you are, what you look like when you're here with us, when your presence is clearly seen. We thank you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. There's some fascinating stuff. When you look at how the Hebrews interacted with God, they did not have a bunch of like 12 steps to know God. Did you know that? They didn't have books. We're the ones that write these books. We have all these books. If you go to the devotional store, is there a devotional store? <laughs> the Christian bookstore. There we go. You go to the Christian bookstore, and there's a whole series on like these steps to know God. But for a Hebrew person, it wasn't steps, it wasn't any of this, because they understood that God was present in their lives now. They understood God was a relational God that was with us now. Everyone say, oh. You didn't have to read the 10 steps that Max Lucado thinks you need to have a relationship with God, because God already has a relationship with you. Cool? It's beautiful. We're the ones that do this. We're the ones that say, well, I can't see God, I can't feel him, so there must be some kind of magical equation that puts me in line with him. Think about this. If God is the source of all our existence, of everything, he moves, breathes, all of it, we feel, we're part of it. Think of how messed up and off track we've got with compartmentalizing God. Watch this now. I'm going to step on some toes. You ready? Some of you, some of you have this idea that on Sabbath, you listen to what kind of music? Sabbath music. I remember in the mornings at home, I'd wake up and my dad, I'd go put in a tape, because that's what we had back then, tapes. You guys are judging me. I see it already. We'd put in a tape, and my dad would be like, Tony, that's not Sabbath music. I'd be like, oh, oh no, you're right. I got to put in Christian music, which oftentimes is like a terrible knockoff of normal music. <laughs> Less talent. And so what happens is that we compartmentalize. And we say, on Sabbath, I listen to this music. But the rest of the week, I'm a secular person. For a Hebrew, it wasn't like that. For a Hebrew, it was just music. It was music because everything lived and breathed through God. The music you listened to didn't change from Monday to Saturday. You all hear that? If you're listening to something that you shouldn't be listening to and on Sabbath you're like, ooh, clean, get me clean, let me put on Christian music, you may be missing the point. Check this out. These compartments that we do with God. Next picture, please. A lot of us, we act certain ways. Again, we've compartmentalized our lives. At work, we're professional, and we act certain ways. At, in the public, well, this is how I act. With my secular friends, we even have secular friends. Isn't that funny? My Adventist friends are here, and my secular friends are here. Can you imagine if, that's, if you told your friend, by the way, I call you my secular friend. Be like, what's your problem? Are you serious? I'm your secular friend? And so we have all these ridiculous divisions, and oftentimes what happens is church and God become very small. And so no wonder that on Sabbath, we put so much into it. 
Because it's the only day that we actually take time to be spiritual people. Why do you think so many people walk away from a service feeling unfulfilled? Because they thought that they could compartmentalize God and that that one day they were going to get all of their spiritual being, their connection with God on that one day. It was the one day they allowed themselves to see the full spectrum of God. You all hear it? Someone say, ouch, it hurts. Next slide. And so for the Hebrews, they were spiritual-minded people, and they saw God everywhere. For Hebrew people, God was already living among them. So when Jesus comes, consider this. God has been present with them. They understand that. When Jesus shows up, all of a sudden, you're seeing the rainbow. You're tasting the rainbow, Skittles. It is the culmination of God being present with his people. He comes here and he says, bam, now look at what it looks like when I am present with you, when I'm interacting with you. Look what happens. This is what it looks like when I am so with you. I couldn't be any closer to you. So in history, God walks among his people. He lives with them. And his people enjoy being in company with him. But so many of us, we have numbed ourselves to his presence. And sometimes we've numbed ourselves so much from it that we move toward death instead of life. I want you to consider some interesting, interesting things here. I'm going to the next slide. The Old Testament. How many of you have ever heard people say this about the Old Testament? I just want to just throw things at you today. Are you okay with that? Yes, pastor. Good. So I'm going to throw some things at you and take what you want. Because the Old Testament, how many of you have ever heard that the Old Testament is like an angry God? The Old Testament, if you want to tell someone about Jesus, about how good God is, you tell them first, well, I would read Matthew. It's the softer side of Sears, right? It's the softer side of God. The Old Testament, when I read this book, there is one main gospel message that is heard over and over and over again. It's in the songs it's in the Lamentations. It's in the stories. It's everywhere. It is the dominant theme of the Old Testament. And it's this. Our God reigns. Our God reigns. He is with us. He gives us freedom when he reigns. He brings us prosperity. He brings us joy. He brings us life. He is so connected to us. The main theme of the Old Testament is not a God of wrath. It is a God that reigns with his people. Next concept I want you to see is one that I just, it's going to offend you, and I'm excited that it will. Because a lot of you have bought into an idea about God, and it's this. It's that God is a God that is in heaven, and we are on earth. We even have songs that we sing. You are God in heaven, and here am I on earth. And it's so weird and awkward and distant. The word heavens in the Hebrew, it's not referring to some place up in the sky where God abides, and you are down here. Uh-oh. Paradigm shift. Heresy. Here it is. The Hebrew word means this. It means the space, the atmosphere around you. Everything around you. Think about that for a second. God is not just present in the sky. He is present in the very air we breathe. His presence dominates everything around us. Spiritual people, we cannot help but be moved by God because everywhere we go, we see God. Think about that for a minute. Everywhere we go, we see God's presence. We are spiritual people. How many of you have ever heard people talk like this? Oh, I just can't wait to get to heaven because this world is ugly. I hate it. 
It's so full of sin and evil and nasty and gross. I just can't wait to leave. If that is you, I want to tell you something. You are missing the reality of God right now. You are missing the beautiful spectrum of God's presence right now. We should be experiencing heaven, God's presence with us. We should be experiencing it now. Not later. Not just later. We should experience it now. Think about what that looks like. When Jesus comes again, we're not doing this. Oh, my eyes, it's too bright. We're saying, oh, I'm so excited. I'm... There it is. The water's being sprayed, and you're like, I've been seeing it all my life, and now it's even brighter. There it is. Amen? God's presence is with us now. Next slide. Keep one ahead of me, if you would. So, in 1 Kings 18, 36 through 39, we've become a people who sometimes miss it. But check this story out. It's so cool. I've read this story many, many times, and it never occurred to me that maybe I was reading it incorrectly. Because 1 Kings 18, 36 through 39, wow. All right, I'll read it for you. Elijah, do you guys remember the story of Elijah and the altar? He's kind of at battle with these other guys who are saying their gods are stronger. Remember this story? Well, essentially what happens is these other worshipers of these other gods, they come together at this altar and they start doing crazy things to try to get their gods' attention. They're looking up into the sky and they're screaming. They're cutting themselves. They're like, God, notice me! They're doing ugly, gross things to try to get their gods' attention. And what Elijah does here it's pretty interesting when you consider the concept of heaven, the atmosphere, the space we're living in. What happens is this. At the usual time for the offering, the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet walked up to the altar and prayed, O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, prove today that you're God, the God of Israel, and that I am your servant. Prove that I have done all this at your command. O Lord, answer me. Answer me so the people will know you. That should always be the reasoning behind anything we do. So that people may know him. O Lord, our God, that you brought us back to yourself. And immediately fire from the Lord flashed down from heaven and burned up the young bull. Think about this. If God's presence is amongst us right now, Think about what that looked like. Did the fire actually just come burning down from the sky? Think about how much powerful, how much more powerful this is. God's literal presence was already there. Did Elijah have to do anything crazy to get his attention? Boom! It's there. Amen? That's the kind of God we serve. His presence was there, and the altar, bam! It just blows up. And everyone backs off because they realize that God is with us. That God is powerful. When you look at the story of Elisha in 2 Kings, his predecessor, it's really fascinating to me, this story. Elisha, God has been telling him, it's so frustrating to these other armies. Because every single time these other armies are going to attack the Israelites, God tells Elisha, hey, hey, by the way, this is about to happen. Can you imagine how frustrating that must have been for that other army? They'd show up prepared. They'd be there at like 3 in the morning. We've got these guys. Why are they here again? Oh, no. So they started to think there was a spy. And then they realized, no, 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 no. Elisha is the only one who seems to connect with this God. We kill Elisha. They won't know we're coming. So they show up one morning surrounding this valley. And Elisha, you can just imagine him giving a very different response than we would. He walks out and he's like this. Ha! Huh. Wow. And his servant's like, dude, you're in trouble. There's a lot of them. Right? You're terrified. Would you be terrified? 
I would be terrified. All those men after me, terrified. But what Elisha says here is beautiful. Don't be afraid, Elisha told him, for there are more on our side than theirs. And again, if you're Elijah's servant, you're like, that's cute. He's finally lost it. Let's just go sit down, Elisha. Elisha prays, Lord, open his eyes, let him see. The Lord opened the young man's eyes, and when he looked up, he saw that the hillside around Elisha was filled with horses and chariots of fire. Did they show up right when he opened his eyes? No. They were there. God's presence was there. Elisha could see the full spectrum of God. When God's people start to see God's presence wherever they go, powerful things always follow. Can you imagine if we were the community that started asking God to open our eyes? Lord, let us be aware of how good you are, how powerful you are. Open our eyes to the realities of who you are every day. What would our prayer lives look like? Think about this. It would totally change the way this community looks and interacts with one another. It would change the way I interact with God. He would no longer be just this presence in the sky that I have to call down. I would be thankful that he's already here. Genesis 28, 16. So many of us, though, we miss the point. And we miss the very presence of God. And so in Genesis, there's this story where Jacob has been running from God. And it says that Jacob has run from God so much. Gen uh, Genesis 28, 16, not 26. Uh, 28, 16. Jacob has been running. He's got caught up in what is going on in his life. He's driven by fear. He has stopped understanding God's presence, and he's scared to death. He's relying on himself. And he falls asleep there, and it says he woke up from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I wasn't even aware of it. When I go to church in different communities, I see a lot of people who might say that exact same thing. Surely God's presence today was with us. And I wasn't even aware of it. I don't want to be that person anymore. In, in Exodus, there's a story about Moses. Exodus 3, Moses has been living as a shepherd. He's been living in this area for a long time. And it says that he sees this burning bush. He sees it. And so he gets closer to it. The Lord saw Moses coming to take a closer look. God called to him from the middle of the bush, Moses, Moses. Moses replies, here I am. Don't come any closer, the Lord warned. Take off your sandals, for you are standing on holy ground. My question, how long had this ground been holy before Moses had to notice? God's presence was with Moses the whole time. How long had that ground been holy? He'd been there the whole time. Here's something really fascinating to think about. The Jews, when they read, when they read this story of Moses, this is what they do. They said that, next slide please. When they, when they, they feel that when Moses went and he saw the bush, what does God say when he says, who are you? What does God respond to Moses with? Here I am. And that word here is not even present. It's actually just I am. So in the Hebrew, the Hebrew actually says he just said his name. Now follow me. The Hebrew form for God, which is so holy, they don't even say it, is Yahweh. The words Yahweh, the letters, it goes like this. Yod, heh, vad, heh. What do you notice about that, those, those letters? It's really breathy. So follow me now. 
the Hebrews believed that when Moses went to the bush, that God didn't say, I am. He did this. <sighs> and he said his name. Follow me a little further. What is the first thing you do when you're born? You take your first you say God's name. What is the last thing you do before you die? You take your last. God could not be any closer to his people. The very breath you breathe should be a reminder of how close he is to us. The very breath you breathe. God's presence is so very close. He's intimate with his people. So there's the story I want to tell you. And I read about this girl, and I'm just going to share with you her story. There's this girl, she had a life filled with brokenness and pain. She couldn't bring herself to accept that God is present with his people, that he interacts with us. Because she'd experienced so much pain, she started to actually believe maybe God just created and walked away because that's what her life felt like and so at age 12 she starts ballet and she had a coach that taught her to hate her body taught her that she was never good enough and she associated this coach with her understanding of God as an absent father who simply didn't accept her and she used to dance to deal with her anger to run from the hurt of an absent God until one day, as she's dancing in rehearsal, she stops and looks at the dance through the mirror. She sees just how beautiful the dance is. She sees that she's part of this dance, part of this beauty, part of the music. And it's at this moment she sees a different image of not just herself, but the full, she says, the full manifestation of God's presence. She sees his presence in the passion of the dancers all around her. She becomes aware of a God that did not leave her, but was present with her through all the practices, all the choreography, all of the shows. And it's in that moment she realizes that this dance, this thing she thought she was doing to get away from God, was only another reflection of who he is. And as she turns around, she sees the beautiful colors. She breathes in the air that is so full of possibility. The spiritual world, just like Elisha's followers saw, becomes clear to her. She falls to the floor weeping tears of joy over the beautiful realization of a God that did not leave her, but had been present with her her whole life. He'd been dancing with her through the pain and the brokenness. I do not serve a God that just created and left. We serve a God that is so close to his people. We serve a God that absolutely loves, adores us. We serve a God that is constant through the pain and the brokenness and the joy and the possibility. We serve a God that could not get any closer to his people. He sent his only son to show us that. It's like he said, I've done all these things. I've reigned with you all this time. Now I've literally come to live with you. I couldn't get any closer. When you are feeling alone and broken and hurt, ask God not for a sign. Ask him to open your eyes. Ask God to open your eyes to his presence that is already here. That is the kind of God we serve.